year or two that uh, uh, Kimberley was Kimberley was a great place to grow up. We had everything there. We did everything. We were part of everything, part of the community, and uh, I think it, uh, it 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 prepared us quite well for later life and for moving around and everything. It we, was great. We 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 started the um, Hebrew Play Center with a few other people. We we on all the committees. It really gave us a, a lesson in life and. Uh, we're now in Toronto. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you, Bernard and Helen. Delia. No, wait till Bobby arrives because he's come, he's joining me. Okay, then we'll go uh, Trevor. Right. Uh, I suppose I really left Kimberley uh, in uh, 1957 after leaving Boys High, <clears throat> although that was just to go to uh, the odd university or two or three. Um, and after doing a couple of degrees at Rhodes and a master's degree at Peter Maritzburg, I then went to Cambridge and did a doctorate and found an American girl and married her. Um, <clears throat> spent a year in California and since then I've been in London. I taught first of all in London University and then uh, in New York University, I have a study center near the British Museum. And I've been in London since, well, forever. Uh, I was a university lecturer for over 50 years uh, and I am now fully retired. Uh, after my wife died, I moved to this flat, which is literally two minutes away from Paddington Station. And I, moved here because my daughter is 20 minutes walk away and I go there every Friday night and as often in between as I possibly can. And Okay, that, that's, that's fine. <laughs> Great. Uh, now for Norman Milton. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So firstly, just our history, we, I, we, I left Kimberley in 59. Uh, we came back and got married there in 1962. And we went overseas for two years, saw a lot of Geraldine and Ronnie when we lived in London. And then when we moved back to South Africa, we moved to Durban and we lived there until 86 when we emigrated to Los Angeles. And we kind of came here because David was in LA and Lucille was in San Francisco. Um, so that's our travels, but they're just a couple of memories in Kimberley. Uh, we went back in 2010 and on Geraldine's recommendation, we stayed at the Kimberley Club, which has become a kind of B&B. &B. And I just remember my feeling of being there amongst it being really, really nice was going into the bar and sitting and having a drink and thinking, here's a Jewish woman sitting in the Kimberley Club, which had been known to be so anti-Semitic. And it was a very, very strange feeling. Um, and then I watched last week and saw a lot about the shul. And what I remembered was when we were, which would be the early 1950s, when we used to go to shul, the shul was packed to the degree that we had to sit on the stairs. And for some reason, my mother was like in the middle of a row, so I couldn't sit next to her, but for some reason, this will interest Geraldine, I sat on the stairs right next to Althea, and she kind of thinged me through the service, and I so remember being with her in that specific night, probably one of my most, most enjoyable Cornidre nights of my life. And we actually were back in South Africa last year, not in Kimberley, and saw Althea. She's 96, I think, Geraldine, and she is absolutely amazing. So yeah. um, I think that's my contribution for now. And yeah. now I'm off and we'll talk. That's lovely. Thank you. Um, Barney, it just might be a moment you can talk more, but just tell us about being in the Kimberley Club. Unmute. Well, <clears throat> Kimberley Club is a very different place today from what it was uh, 50, 60 years ago. 
um, I actually became a member of the club when I became governor of the shul. I was invited to become a member of the club, and that is a very big change for the books. Uh, I've had a, a wonderful relationship with the club. Uh, we had my daughter's wedding there. Um, we cushioned the kitchen. Um, and uh, we had a kosher caterer in there. We, uh, uh, and we did have Dalla in the Bridget Oppenheimer room uh, under, under a portrait of Bridget. So uh, my memories of the club are very good ones. I was in fact there yesterday. Um, my, uh, my sister had her 70th and uh, yeah, it, uh, uh, Kimberley is an amazing place. It has its problems, uh, just like whole of South Africa has got its problems, uh, but it is still an amazing place. And I think David Allen would agree with me is uh, a little bit further down. Um, when you go to Shul in Kimberley, even though there might only be four or five people, you really feel like you've been to Shul. Uh, the, the Shul itself has an amazing presence about it. And uh, I mean, I can talk for hours on uh, the experiences we've had. Uh, and uh, once a year, we're a full community when we bring our team down from Johannesburg for Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur. But every Friday night we are there uh, David is one of the stalwarts with myself, uh, Barry Katz, uh, Trevor Datna, and uh, it's still an amazing place. And uh, yeah, you all only owe us a visit. Come and see us. Okay, we'll come back to you again, Barney. Um, um, I thought now, uh, I wanted just to say that the, originally, the Kimberley Club was not anti-Semitic. It couldn't be because most of the diamond dealers and, and buyers were Jews and they all were there. They were all members of the club mm -hmm. at the time. Uh, the Oppenheimers, you know, uh, all, they were all. So I don't think it has such a, um, a record of anti-Semitism, but, you know, it's still a bit snooty, I'm sure. Um, uh, now I want to go to... Can Milton um, come in? Hmm? Can Milton talk? Oh, of course. Yes, Milton. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, Norm, Norm has given you most of the present and recent background. So I'm going to go way back. I was born in Krugersdorf, actually. And um, after my dad died, my mother brought me and Lucille, who's on there somewhere, I can't see her right now, uh, to Kimberley to live with her parents, uh, the Brenners. And we moved into their home on Blacking Street. I don't know if anybody knows where that is. And I spent my childhood in Kimberley, going to uh, Kimberley Boys High. Um, I, my buddies, that I grew up with originally were like uh, Effie Pick, Michael Sperber, uh, Bernard Frank. Um, I was trying to think Leon of his name. Uh, Gerald, Gerald Reichman, I think his name was, I can't remember. Um, and Theodore, I see, I think I saw Theodore a minute ago. Um, I used to see him in my youth. So then, then there was a slightly older crowd that I got involved with later. Um, I spent a lot of, I, I did my uh, pharmacy apprenticeship in Kimberley at a pharmacy called uh, Richmond Pharmacy on the top of, uh, just up the road from Kiddies. I don't know if that still exists. And after my apprenticeship, I went to Durban, came back to Kimberley very few times. Um, so I missed a lot of my sisters growing up in Kimberley. Spending it in Durban. All right. Go. Okay. Right. Yes. So we can go straight to Lucille then. You come in there, Lucille. Unmute and. Uh... Okay. Can you hear me? Because I thought I had audio yeah. problems, but you can hear. Yes. Okay. Um, so I am Lucille Friedman and have been Lucille Friedman all my life because I married a Friedman. 
and um, left Kimberley at 17, just after Milton and Norma got married in 1962, and basically lived in Cape Town, went to drama school. Um, Michael and Georgia, my children, were born in Cape Town, and we left in 1973 and came to the West Coast, where I've pretty much been now for 47 years. <sighs> That's amazing. I did spend five years in New Jersey, um, and I wanted to say this to Trevor. Um, Barbara, your cousin, and I have maintained our friendship since Standard 2, and she was in New Jersey at the time, and so we reconnected, and uh, even now we still see each other, speak to each other once or twice a year, birthdays for sure. Um, I want to also say this, Trevor, is that I think there was one time, Barbara, you and I, and maybe a few others went to Riverton, I think, and you taught me the words of the um, Hallelujah Chorus, which every time I hear, think of you, so that's quite extraordinary. Um, this, this is an amazing thing, Geraldine. I only sort of knew about it about a year ago, I think, and have meant to write and say, please send me can I join the website? And I haven't. Um, I live in... Your, your, your sister-in-law should have given me your address long ago. She, she should have, and I should have, I should have written, but, but I didn't. Last year was an interesting year in this country, more, than, more so than the three years before. I live in Oakland, which is across the bay from, from um, San Francisco, and I have had several careers. One was catering, catering for a long time. And then ultimately I did tax and financial planning, which I just retired from. And I am now 76 years old, which astounds me. And um, that's the deal. Thanks. Lovely. Well, it's lovely to have you. And certainly uh, we'll get your address and put you on the mailing list. That'll be that's great. Yeah? Yeah. So, um, next we'll go to Marion, who was with us last week. Hi, everybody. Bernard, I just want to tell you and Helen that tomorrow morning, Joy Turvey is playing cards at my house and we meet once a week to play Kaluki and we all love it. <laughs> we fanatics. <laughs> Lovely to see you, Bernard. You haven't changed at all. I left Kimberley in 1963, I think, or 64. I can't even remember. I got married in Kimberley in 1966, that I do remember. And I, um, shortly thereafter, I lost my mom and then I brought my dad with us to Cape Town and he was in Highlands House for 10 years and he was pretty happy there. He made a little life for himself and he was pretty happy. But I have not been back to Kimberley since the late 60s. And um, I believe it's very different today than what it was when we were all there, which is in a way quite sad, but I suppose, you know, we all have to move on. Um, uh, we have two children, Les and I. We have a daughter here who lives across the road from us with her little boy. And we have a son in London who has two gorgeous children. And uh, that's us. Okay, that's lovely. Thank you. Thank you, Marian. Um, Joy. Hi there. Um, I live in Johannesburg, have lived here for 30 odd years. Um, I matriculated from Kimberley Bells High in 77, 1977, and have uh, went back for a couple of couple of times during that time um, when my parents still lived there, but Thereafter, when we all left Kimberley, um, I think I've only been back a few times, um, haven't been back for long. I just want to, to mention to uh, Milton and to Lucille that uh, we are connected in some way. Um, I don't know if you remember, but my mother, Beryl, was a sister to Manny Brenner. So that is, that is our connection, our, our family connection. Uh, you mentioned the Brenners, so I'm, I'm just saying that. Um, as I say, I live in Johannesburg um, and have for, for many years, and I'm, I'm very pleased to, to join this group and see faces I haven't seen for a very long time. Delia, you look wonderful. 
and uh, yeah and David and Shirley I haven't seen you for so long I haven't been to Kimberley for so long it's lovely to see you too so thanks Okay, thank you, Joy. Um, Gail Bendix, unmute. Hi. <laughs> Thanks, Geraldine, for this opportunity. It's great to see all the faces. Uh, as you can see, my background is actually where Otis's bottle store used to be. The last time uh, we went back to Kimberley was uh, 2014. And just for a day trip to see our cousin Arnold, then he took us around uh, Arnold Rock, took us to the Kimberley Shore, to the cemetery, and we rode past the you know, Girls High and did those usual things. And funny enough, he also took us to the Kimberley Country Club for lunch, which I had more or less those same feelings because I understood that at some point in time, that uh, Jewish membership was not encouraged. But moving on to that, uh, we live in Toronto in Thornhill and um, we have a son, Mark and I have a son who lives at home with us and the daughter who lives in Toronto with her husband and one grandchild for us, a little boy, Kaylin. We were fortunate that all our family members moved to Toronto area, starting with the Waltz, then we immigrated, then the Aronsons, then the Otis's, and then our parents, Sally and Sheila. And for the time that we were all together was a lovely time spent by all. Uh, when the pandemic came, we haven't been together as a family unit since um, last year before Pesach. Uh, except we did do one socially distanced uh, visit in the park in August. Uh, we had just uh, in the summer, we had just a little bit of time where everybody came together physically distanced and that was great to see everybody, but we are still unable to get together in Canada as a family and um, our parents have sadly passed away but we are still fortunate all to be in the same vicinity. Thank, Thank you. you. I think it's very wonderful when families were able to move on block, parents and children all to be in one place. Like uh, I think you did at some stage, uh, Delia and the, um, the Kleins in Melbourne and uh, David and Norma in Los Angeles. So it's really uh, a good news because otherwise, South African families are so widely spread out. So um, there we go. Um, now, um, Carol, would you like to come in? Carol Moss was Carol Goldberg. Hi, can you all hear me? Yes. Um, I'm Carol Goldberg Moss. I live in Atlanta. I was born in Kimberley. My grandparents were Bernard and Sarah Goldberg. So we used to come to Kimberley every June vacation. I don't know when last I was in Kimberley. Uh, every time I come to Cape Town every year, I threaten that I'm going to go to Kimberley. And I think if I do come again, I definitely will go up for the day. But I have such wonderful memories of my grandmother taking me to John Orr's, I'm sure it was John Orr's, and she would wear her mink coat and everybody used to bow down and say, hello, Mrs. B, hello, Mrs. B. It was, we just had the most fabulous, fabulous holidays there. I've got a son and daughter in on grandchild who live in Atlanta. I've got a daughter who moved to California a year ago. So hopefully to Los Angeles, so hopefully I'll be visiting her soon. But um, when this pandemic is over, my next trip will be back to Cape Town. But I just have wonderful, wonderful memories of Kimberley. That's great. Thank you, Carol. Um, now, um, Walt Manfred, that must be Michelle, is it? And that's a sister of Gail, 
and another That's daughter right. of Dolly and Sheila Otis, am I right? That's right, yes. So firstly, Geraldine, I appreciate your letters and connecting us all. And uh, we left Kimberley in 1979, came straight to Toronto, Canada. And my parents, Sally and Sheila said, are you crazy to go to such a cold country so far away? And nine years later, they all joined us slowly, one by one. One by one. And uh, they set up a business uh, Cedo Snacks selling South African goods, which my brother Neil still runs to this day. And uh, the South Africans are very good to him. He's, and my mom used to make the Biltong Burrovos, but now Neil has found somebody else to make it for him. And, uh, and he knows all the South Africans. We, we've been here longer than him, but he knows them all. And uh, we have a big South African connection through, through Neil. And we were last in Kimberley, I think, in 1992 and enjoyed growing up there in a small town and uh, great memories. So thank you. And uh, Rona, my sister Rona, is supposed to be on the call. I don't see her, but, uh, and I asked Neil to, to hook in as well, but we'll see. So thank you. Okay, great. Um, Shirley, Shirley, who is Shirley? Can you unmute in the bottom left corner? Yes. Yes. Hi. Um, Shirley Altspanger. I live in Israel. And um, I was born in Kimberley and spent the first four years of my life in Kimberley. I um, have, um, after that, um, I have never really lived in Kimberley, but spent many, many winter holidays in Kimberley, of which I have wonderful memories. My last visit to Kimberley was about 10 years ago, when um, Arnold Ralph met my husband and I, and took us to the Sh um, Kimberley Synagogue and also to the two cemeteries. The visit to the synagogue was very nostalg nostalgic for me because my late grandfather was the reverend and the shochat and the Hebrew teacher of the Hebrew con congregation. And- um, He was Maros, uh, reverend. That's right. My, my mother was Mani Maros and um, we spent holidays with my two aunts in Kimberley. Um, and um, it was, uh, Kimberley, it meant a lot to me, and I just loved the, um, going, uh, going to the shul, and, and um, I now have been, as I said, oh, I live in Israel, have been living here for many years, have a very, very big family here, all very close to us, but my memories of Kimberley, will always remain with me. Thank you for okay. the opportunity to speak, uh, Geraldine. Thank you, Shirley. Linda, would you like to carry on? Hi, good evening, everybody. I'm Linda Capon. So as my sister has said, we have a, a connection with um, Lucille and Morton, Beverly being our first cousin and uh, who joined us last week on the same platform. Um, I left Kimberley in 19, oh, I came to Johannesburg in 1981. Um, but I went back, I arranged our 40th class reunion in 2012. Um, so we do for our 50th next year. We'll see if we manage to get there uh, to Kimberley or not. I think it's probably easier to have it in Cape Town. But um, yeah, we managed to get quite a lot of people coming through to the reunion. Uh, Judith Mel joined us. And uh, the last time we were in Cape Town, Laura Radomsky, Laura Sussman joined us. So uh, Linda Jacobson also uh, was from my year. Um, I have a son who is married and lives in Sweden. And yeah, obviously join my sister, that's it. Lovely, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Daphne, do you want to come in and just say hi to the new people? Can you? 
Can you unmute? Daphne Tobe Gillis is probably one of our seniors, but you need to unmute. Bottom left corner, Daphne, unmute. Take your cursor down and then you'll see it. You've got a, you've got a, a technical expert by your side. <laughs> Oh dear. Okay. Now are you unmuted? You should yeah, know. I'm, uh, unmuted. Yes. See, and then I can work with it. <laughs> it's very interesting watching all of, of these people, most of whom left Kimberley long after I left Kimberley, long before they did. But we could see the family resemblance, as soon as they started speaking, they all speak the same way as their parents did. And obviously, because I was so, am so much older than most of you, but we are one of the few Jewish families still living in South Africa. I've got three sons living in Cape Town. Five grandchildren, all married, living in Cape Town. So that makes 10 grandchildren and four great-grandchildren. And we all think about Kimberley. We all talk about Kimberley. We go back regularly. We go to visit the grave. We go to visit the houses. And our house in Milner Street has been turned into a and b I haven't been inside it, but... It's still there. And every now and again, we meet somebody who has some connection with Kimberley. It, the people from Kimberley are different from anybody anywhere else. <laughs> Our grandparents started there with their jewelry business. They remained there. They brought up their children there. And life goes on. Thank you. Thank you, Daphne. Um, Cheryl, do you want to come in now? Unmute. Oh, um, I was on last week, so I won't take too much of your time. Um, I, I'm the daughter of um, Helen and Icky Brown, and it's actually my dad's yard site this evening. So um, I just wanted to speak about him because he was such a good natured, kind, wonderful father. I'm sure you all remember Averbuck and Brown and the Brown family, um, started by my grandfather, Harry Brown and Rafael Averbuck. Um, I was just listening to the reminiscences. Somebody mentioned John Orse and going for tea. And I remember my mother and I getting dressed up and meeting Polly Horwitz there for tea. And uh, I remember delicious little uh, uh, scones with cheese and um, it was just always a special treat. And chauvy toast. And chauvy toast, exactly. That's what it was. Um, I also was thinking about the Kimberley Club. And the story I heard a long time ago, I don't know if it's true, was you had to be recommended to be a member. So when it started, it was a very waspish establishment. And one of the reasons, one of the ways Cecil Rhodes convinced Barney Bonato to cooperate with him was he said he would make him a member of the Kimberley Club. So it's probably um, probably true, but I think they wanted to keep him out, not because he was Jewish, but because of what he was. He was such a bumptious character, a wonderful character, but not the sort of person that, you know, he would walk in somewhere on his hands and uh, um, juggle. But <laughs> well, he was an actor also. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Cheryl. Delia, is, are you ready yet or do you want to wait still? No, you want to wait still. That's fine. Um, David Friedman, I see you here. David was born in Kimberley. Come and tell us about it. He's got more loving memories of Kimberley because I think he left when he was a year old. So tell us, you need to unmute. Uh, bottom left. Uh, Yep. Okay. Now that's not entirely true. 
was more than one year old. <laughs> I, was, I was born at 10 Ellesmere Road in Kimberley, and the very first person in this world that ever saw me was your father. In those days, I think most people were born at home and your dad delivered me, Uncle Noel. Just to see where I show where I fit in, there were four Bergman sisters living in Kimberley, all of whom married in Kimberley. My mother was a first cousin to all the four Bergman. She was also a Bergman. And in fact, Geraldine's grandfather and my grandfather <coughs> were very, very close in age and very close brothers who came to Kimberley together in partnership. But my grandfather unfortunately died in the flu epidemic in 1918. And for practical purposes thereafter, Jacob Bergman, Geraldine's grandfather was really, in a manner of speaking, my mother's guardian. Okay, um, my father was also lived all his life in Kimberley. And we left Kimberley with the outbreak of war, which was about 1940. And my dad was in the army, but I always through all the war years regarded Kimberley as my home. And we were definitely going to return to Kimberley after the war. And we didn't sell our house in Kimberley until in fact 1944, where we just happened to end up in Durban where my dad was still in station. He was demobilized from the army in 1944. And to my real upset, I was absolutely distraught at the time. They decided to stay in Durban and not go back to Kimberley. But my aunt and grandfather were still living in Kimberley at one memorial road, to be precise. My father's sister, was then the manager of Finbro Furnitures, which if I remember rightly, was at the one far end of Detroit Span Road. Um, I visited Kimberley on a very, very regular basis. In fact, actually all four of my grandparents died and were bur are buried in Kimberley. Uh, I, throughout my school years and then particularly university years. I was at Cape Town University, uh, my cousin, second cousin, same relation as you, Geraldine, Herbert Hendler. And for most of these short vacations, it was impossible for me to get back to Durban. And I generally went with Herbert back to Kimberley. Then later, when we were all married and having kids, we used to visit regularly on a very regular basis the farm of Bergman's Hope. Uh, my kids used to love it. They learned to horse ride and really what it was like to live the life of farmers there. Just as a matter of very, very quickly, Bergman's Hope, from what I could understand, was originally bought by Jacob and David Bergman, your grandfather, my grandfather. And the story, which it may be apocryphal, I'm not sure, was they originally bought a farm which was twice the size of where it ended for five, for, sorry, half a crown a Morgan. And then about two years later, sold half the farm for five shillings a Morgan. So the actual, what remained of Bergman's yeah, hope stood them, in, stood them in for nothing. And then when my grandfather died, his share in Bergman's hope was sold I think to Nate Hendler, or sold either to Jacob Bergman or Nate Hendler, anyhow, eventually the Hendler family uh, came to own it. And then, as I say, I used to come to Kimberley on a regular, regular basis. I remember David Levinson and I playing tennis from time to time on your tennis court, because of course your homes and the Levinson's homes were back to back. And um, again, by strange coincidence, the Levinsons and Milton and Norma, uh, we all ended up, we were all ended up in Durban. And now all of us have ended up in Los Angeles, uh, where in fact we live as Los Angeles distances go not all that far apart. So um, right. it was I lovely. my family in Los Angeles, fortunately uh, got five sons, four of whom are married, seven grandchildren, and 
we're all living in America. Uh, two of the sons, one is in Phoenix, one is in Seattle, but otherwise we're all in uh, Los Angeles, and, but for the pandemic, would be seeing each other on a very regular basis. Thank you, David. Lovely to have you with us. Uh, it's sorry, one further thing. Sorry, one yeah. further thing. Very, very important. Yeah. And that is, Theo was exactly one year to the day younger than me. Okay, but the Theo K that's on today is not our Theo K. You know that. This is Theo no, Clement. Okay, but anyway, <laughs> anyway, your brother Theo and I are My exactly brother, one year apart. Sixteenth of October. <laughs> yeah. Good. Thank you, David. Uh, Itamar Shine. Hello, everybody. I'm uh, I'm a little bit uh, uh, out of my depth here because I don't come from Kimberley. I come from Bloemfontein. I now live in London, uh, but uh, I was put onto this group by uh, Tony Isaacs, uh, a colleague of mine, and uh, he said I should get onto this. I can just tell you a couple of my experiences or my connections with Kimberley. Um, I see most of these people went to Kimberley Boys High or Kimberley Girls High. I went to Gray College and uh, Gray College, uh, I used to play table tennis at Gray College and we once had a team uh, that visited uh, uh, Kimberley and we played table tennis against Kimberley. It was quite an interesting match. I don't even remember where we stayed because many years ago. Um, the other connection I have with Kimberley is that my father was a commercial traveler. And when I was growing up, I used to go on trips with him all over the free state. And from time to time, we did uh, spend uh, a night in Kimberley. I remember the hotel. I've forgotten which or what the name of the hotel was, but uh, I remember my dad uh, buying a ticket from the waiter for the, an Irish sweepstake ticket, which was quite fascinating to me at the time. The other interesting thing about Kimberley is that my dad had quite a few uh, customers, uh, you know, that he used to call on. Um, we had all the samples in the back of the car. We had our driver and I was just a sort of a bit of a schlepper along. And um, I remember there were a couple of customers in Beaconsfield, if there's still such a place that exists there. And there was a chap, I've forgotten what his name was, but he was a Chinese fellow and he had a business somewhere in town. And my dad, uh, you know, he was one of his customers, sold him quite a lot of things. And uh, it was also my first exposure to a Chinese person because there are no Chinese people in the Free State. And then no, and that time the law was that uh, Indian or Oriental uh, people were only allowed to spend 24 hours in, in, within the borders of the free state. It might probably age me a bit, but I am quite a senior citizen, put it that way. <laughs> uh, okay. Anyway, it's really nice uh, talking to you and Geraldine. I do also recollect your, your good husband um, from the My Habonim days. Oh, yeah. And... Uh, he was, very, he was very, very amusing, all I can say. <laughs> he was, yes. Uh, he still is. He still makes me laugh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there will be a few other people who are not exactly from Kimberley or spent very little time in Kimberley. Um, Jonathan, do you want to just say hello? Jonathan Joseph. Uh, you already um, uh, mentioned Polly Horwitz. Did you, you hear that Polly was mentioned? <laughs> I did. Um, yeah, I'm not uh, born in Kimberley and I'm not a Kimberley resident, but I had very, very close ties because I'm half a Horwitz and uh, very much uh, Polly Horwitz was talked about as my grandmother. My other claim to fame in Kimberley terms is my cousin Barney and uh, I um, close and uh, very much uh, value my other cousins who are Kimberley people, Brenda, Sean, Mark, Gary, and Robin. And uh, I should say something about Geraldine as well, because when my father came to Kimberley to train in the Royal Air Force, um, he was uh, rescued um, on Friday nights 
uh, by uh, two particular families. One was the Kretzmar family and the other was the Horwitz family. <laughs> and Geraldine uh, was very much in my father's uh, active memory. Um, and uh, the Kretzmar family uh, famous in, uh, in his lifetime for having offered him a bath, which was a wonderful, uh, wonderful thing. And um, I've been to Kimberley many, many times, most recently to Ida's wedding about 18 months ago, which was wonderful. I have great memories of uh, Lodge Road. I have memories of the twice killed turkey, once by the Shocket, and uh, the other time by my mother's uh, wonderful maid called Lena. Um, I still have the taste of it and I still don't like it. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a wonderful thing. And the other thing I have to talk about are the brown uh, girls. I see Cheryl on and I see Delia. And I have to confess that um, at the age of uh, eight, Delia became my first massive infatuation in my life, which I remind her of every time I see her at a Hoard Simcha. And she hasn't changed a bit. Thank you, Geraldine. Okay, lovely. Nice to have you with us, uh, Jonathan. What about Gary? Gary Allen. Have a go. Gary made the way, the um, Facebook page, is that right? For Kimberly Shaw. That's right, yeah. So my claim to fame is I'm David and Shirley's son. Um, my brothers, Mark and Kevin. Kevin's in the UK. Mark's here in Joburg with me. I live in Joburg at the moment. Visit Kimberly as often as I can, which is not nearly as often as I would like. Um, matriculated from Boys High and went into the Air Force. And as they say, the rest is history. Um, I ended up settling in Joburg through necessity. I've got three sons. Um, and still, Kimberly is everything. I love Kimberly. Um, that is still home, no matter where I go. The Kimberley Shawl is my shawl as far as my heart's concerned. And um, yeah, I don't think there could have been a better place to grow up. Uh, it's interesting to be around Joburg people who went to King David and the like, where your Jewish identity in Kimberley, I was basically through, through most, through the whole of high school, I was practically, the, I was the only Jewish kid in my class throughout high school. Um, in at the last year or two, there was somebody from DR who joined us for a short while, um, but didn't come to shul much and whatever. So I was basically the only practicing Jew, if you want to put it that way, throughout high school, which meant I never really mixed and mingled. I got a strong Jewish identity because all my non-Jewish friends knew exactly where the differences were. And it's interesting to see the difference that Jews that went to King David grew up amongst plenty of Jews that got all the friends. Their identity of a Jew is totally different to somebody who grew up knowing you were a Jew um, from a town where you had such a strong identity. So yeah, most awesome place um, Kimberly gave for me, not only the upbringing, the, 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 the sense of closeness to me, Judaism, because of Kimberly, was one big family. I arrived in Joburg expecting that same family feel, was sorely disappointed, unfortunately. Um, also in Kimberley, I was able to partake in all sorts of things. I was in Boy Scouts. I worked at the museum across the road, which is now with Cecil John Rose's old residence. Um, got involved with going out to the to the the old battlefields, and um, you could get involved in so many different things um, and simply get to all of them on your bicycle. So it was an incredible upbringing. It was an incredible opportunity, and to grow up to become an individual. Thank you, Gary. That's that's lovely. Um, Adele and um, and who's with you? Is it David? Ha I'm David. He, no, there you are. Yes. Oh, you can hear me now. Okay. Yes. I'm, I'm David. I, my parents were Jean and Cecil Cohen, who lived in Kimberley. I was born in Kimberley, lived there until the age of 12, when we moved in, I think either just 19, end of 57 or early 58. I remember lots of the names I see, but the only one I vividly remember, of course, is Bernard and Helen Benjamin, or better known to me as Benji, <laughs> who uh, my brother Raymond and, uh, and Benji and Arnold Raff seem to be the, the, the big trio in my life. And I was just a thorn in their side, I imagine, at that time, <laughs> being the little guy wanting to participate. 
Um, yeah, my memories are still pretty uh, vivid of that era. It was fun growing up there as, as, a, as a small kid. Uh, started my schooling life at Stepping Stones, if anybody remembers that. And then I went to Belgravia School for Sabe and Sabi and then to CBC uh, until leaving in standard two, uh, standard three or standard four. And uh, yeah, it's- uh, Talk but, about your grandparents. Um, my grandparents, yeah. Yes. Well, my grandparents, of course, lived in Kimberley, uh, I guess from about 18 something or other. My grandfather was, I know, was mayor of Kimberley at one stage in the thirties. Um, and it's just incidentally to go back to the Kimberley Club, my recollection of reading things was that Barney Bernardo made it a condition of merging with Cecil John Rhodes that he makes him a member of the, of the Kimberley Club and that was a, a deal breaker. It's, so, it's probably true. It was part of, part of the uh, thing, you know, Rhodes' idea was he had, to, he had to get him on the personal, you know, even though he, he probably hated him, he knew that he had to be nice. He used to take him to the club for lunch. He used to entertain him there. But, you know, Barney held out for a good deal. And as Alfred Byte said, uh, that Rhodes could probably have got the, what he got from Bernardo for m less, fewer millions. But Byte didn't mind paying everybody that everybody should prosper. So, but it's an interesting, if you want to read the whole story, read my Alfred Byte story. It's all in there, <laughs> all the bits about the club and everything. So there we are now. Can I jump in? Yes, please. I'm, Adele. I'm the one that's trying to record the family history for the Cones. There are lots and lots of gaps, but um, I do know, I saw an, um, a newspaper article where it mentioned that his grandfather, uh, Barney Cohn, actually played uh, polo as a young boy in uh, Kimberley. And we think the grandfather was um, had a salt mine. So we are salt, trying to go something. back. Hmm? Yeah, salt something rather. Salt uh, yeah, pan. a salt pan. And so we're trying to go back and uh, try and gather that information. And so if there's anybody in Kimberley who would like to help us, we would be very uh, grateful. We did speak to someone at the uh, museum. What's it called again? Um, what's the McGregor Museum. No, not McGregor. Uh, it's the library and the museum there. Her name was Koki Damini. I don't know if anyone knows. And she gathered some of the information when we knew nothing, but uh, it would be nice to continue doing that. And the other thing is if anybody can give us um, a connection to Sheila Grant, who's Dave's first cousin, uh, email. Unfortunately, we don't have any of her children's uh, contact information we'd like to be able to continue with them so thank you yes it was very sad sheila herself was trying to, she she wrote a wonderful uh, um, description of the frank family in kimberley and she fully intended with adele to write about the coincide of her family but sadly sheila passed away suddenly last uh, was it december or january very unexpectedly so we're very proud that Sheila's not available to do it. Then somebody mentioned Barbara Brody. I thought that Barbara had also passed away. Is that correct? Yes, that uh, two weeks before she yes. passed away. And Sheila actually contacted me and said she'd passed away. Oh, so really? it came as a real shock. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. So. The Cohen family still needs its story, as do several families like the Horwitzes. We're waiting for the Horwitz family. Now, um, who wants to have a go now before we go back to, um, to Shirley and David Allen and to Barney? Um, who hasn't had a... Mark, Mark Horwitz, go.
Yeah, good morning. How is everybody? Um, I am Mark Howard, son of Monica and Derek Howard. And, and uh, first cousins of Barney Howard and Jonathan Joseph. And I live in Los Angeles with my two brothers and my sister. Um, we were very fortunate in that we were all together, including my parents, in Los Angeles for a while until they passed. But uh, we still see each other on a very regular basis. COVID hasn't sort of stopped us much. We also have another cousin living in Los Angeles, which is uh, Jonathan's younger brother, Richard. So it was a family we were all sort of very well connected. Um, I too was in Kimberley about 15, 16 months ago for the wedding, as was my family for Ida's wedding. And I have been back to Kimberley quite a few times. It's uh, a shock to the system unfortunately but it is what it is other than that uh, you know we're all thriving in los angeles everybody's happy our children are all growing up and uh, and very happy to be part of this i look forward to the newsletters on a very regular basis good lovely we look forward to sending them i want to introduce eli rabinovitz eli as you may know knows more about kimberly than lots of you because he's the one who posts all the stories and all the newsletters onto the website together we made up this website he's a partner in in this endeavor and we're very happy that what time is it where you are in Perth? <laughs> You're stealing my thunder, five to three a.m. <laughs> well, that's dedication for you. <laughs> Especially for you, Geraldine. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. I'm sitting in my bedroom. I've just woken up about an hour ago and enjoying the conversation as I did the last meeting. And it's fantastic to see the work that you're all doing because I think it's a fantastic team effort. And I hope that uh, other towns in South Africa can see what you've been doing, but I doubt it. <laughs> so Geraldine is one of a kind. If you've worked with her, you'll know that. And um, so it's, it's just been fantastic working with you. We've had our ups and downs, but we continue, we soldier on, and um, we certainly appreciate all the work that everyone's contributed to. And it's lovely to see all the faces, most probably for the first time or the second time, some of you. So I wish you well and uh, keep going. Strength ahead. Thank you. Thanks, Eli. It's great to have you with us. Um, Tony Isaacs, you don't have a picture, but do you have sound? Can you join us to say something? Um, you have to unmute if you if you're able. Um, or Kevin, you're also there without a picture, but if you if you want to unmute, you can. Have a race, Tony and Kevin. See who does it first. Um, otherwise, just give me a shout if you've been met, left out so far. Um, Delia, has Bobby come here yeah, or you're going to just go without him? You go on, unmute and we'd love to hear Hello. from you. Can you hear from, from me now? You should be able to, to see me. Who's that? Me. Kevin. Kevin, okay. I'm on my mother's iPad now. I see. We can't see you because I haven't put yeah. it in my picture okay. on, but we can hear you. So that's Kevin, Daphne Tobe's son. Carry on, Kevin. Oh, you're not there. So we go back to Delia for the moment. Let's go back to Delia. Okay. Um, hi, everybody. Um, before I say anything else, I would like to thank Geraldine very much for this. It's just such an amazing, amazing effort. This putting together of the Kahila Links website together with Eli and the arranging these Zooms. We watched the recording, Bobby and I, of the, of the previous one last week, and we, were sp we sat here spellbound for two hours. <laughs> I, know I know he's very sad to be missing this. He went down to help my son-in-law with the business with something, and he can't get out. He's stuck there. So he might still make it back before we end, in which case he'll say hello to all of you. But he said, I must just go ahead without him. Um, when I think back to Kimberley, I think about, first of all, my own childhood growing up in Kimberley, the feeling of security and safety, of happiness, 
of community, just being part of a bigger, an entity bigger than myself and knowing that there were people around who were watching you with love and it was just an amazing experience. And then I was fortunate to bring up my own three children in Kimberley as well. And we often talk about it. And I expected them after moving to America and bringing up their own children in America that they'd sort of look down on their, on their bringing up in Kimberley. And they all say how lucky they were to be brought up in Kimberley, how, how much they gained by it. And yeah. people say to me, remark to me that my children that our children are different and i always say well where i come from they're all like that because i think that kimberley children and south african children are diff very very different to what we encounter in the rest of the world um on the zoom last week there were quite a few boys who went to boys high school and were boarders at at, at uh, boys high and i taught there for 12 years and I've had a long career in education, but those 12 years were extremely happy years for me. I always think back to Kimberley Boys Hub with great fondness. Um, my father went to CBC, and as Cheryl mentioned, it's my dad's yacht site starting tonight. So we, we're very nostalgic today about dad and all the goings on that we had with him and the wonderful um, father he was to us. And when I got to, to Baltimore, I made a very close friend. We're still very close. And we felt, like, we felt like we'd known each other all our lives until we started talking about our families and discovered that both our fathers had been together at CBC. Unfortunately, there's nobody around to ask if they were in the same year or if they were, I'm sure they're connected in some way because the Jewish boys always stuck together in Kimberley. I've met many people um, over the years who came from Kimberley. Either their, their parents were stationed there during the war and they were born in Kimberley or a grandparent came from Kimberley. And it's just, Kimberley is an amazing place to come from. I think we all are so fortunate. Uh, we, we left South Africa in 1990 and went to California. Um, our children had all, had all grown up at that point. Our, our youngest was, uh, had just been out of school a year. And we moved to Irvine. We brought my father with and my sister Jenny and her family came. Through. We all came together and we came to California because Cheryl and Morris were there. So from Cheryl and Morris being the only uh, members of our family was there, there with their family, suddenly they were responsible for all three families for a while until we found our feet. Irvine was a wonderful place to grow up in, a wonderful place to live in. And um, after 18 years, we moved to Baltimore, Maryland. We now have to deal with snow and with the, all the elements, everything that comes with elements. Um, I have one daughter here in Baltimore, my eldest, Lara. She has four children of her own. So I have very close grandchildren who I see or communicate often. Now with COVID, it's usually me standing on my balcony with my cell phone and one of them standing below with their cell phone. But at least I do get to see them. Um, I have a daughter, uh, my other daughter, Justine, is in Montana. And if you know anything about Montana, they have nine months of winter. So it's not a place that we, that we visit very often, but uh, we do see them a couple of times a year. And there are two children there as well. Um, and um, Arnie, our son, is in California in Irvine, and he's near to Jenny. He and Jenny are very close. They're both very um, involved in music. They're both musicians. And, and um, I just feel so happy that they've got each other there in California. Um, most of my life here has been in education and I've had some amazing experiences. Bobby and I are both retired, although you wouldn't think it when I said he's at work today, but um, he's, he, will, he helps the kids in their business. So when there's a problem, he's has, he has to be there. Um, my last, our last visit to Kimberley was about three years ago. And then prior to that, a few years before that, where we stayed with Beryl. Beryl is still in Kimberley. She's still in the same house. She's still the same old Beryl that we all knew. And um, we keep in close contact with her and we get the Kimberley news through her. I think Barney, I saw you three years ago when we were in Kimberley as well. And Barney's sister, Brenda. And at that time, we also saw Phyllis Sachs and Ida. Um, 
But every time we go to Kimberley, there are fewer and fewer people to see. The one thing that we do love when we go to Kimberley is going to the Kimberley Shore. It brings back so many memories. And I remember sitting on the, also as Norma Ann mentioned, sitting on the stairs or the floor or between the, seat, the seats on the high holidays. Um, when I became, when I was older and I realized what we were actually sitting on, they were bent with chairs with the back legs sawed off so that they were fit on the stairs. But I remember my granny Clara with great fondness, how she was very interested always in our Jewish education. And um, I just think we had a wonderful grounding in South Africa. We had a wonderful grounding in Kimberley and how fortunate we were to have all, get, have all that value out of the years that we spent in Kimberley. Jonathan, I remember your visits to Kimberley. Um, I remember them with great fondness. Um, David Friedman, you mentioned Ellesmere Road. We lived in at 1A Ellesmere Road. But when I was born, my parents were, were living in a, a flat in Barney's mother's house in Lodge Road, Monty Polly's house. So we have very, very close links with you guys. And of course, my first cousin, David, who I very seldom see, is on the Zoom today. So David and Shirley, it's lovely to see you. I'm getting a lot of nachas seeing you guys and seeing Gary here. And uh, just everybody be well, say stay for the, safe for the rest of this COVID and may we all soon be out and about and free of the danger of COVID. So lovely to see you all. Thank you, Delia, it's wonderful. And I want to say that your family, particularly your mother, was so central to Kimberley community life. You know, and nothing happened without Helen sitting at the piano and teaching us songs and um, singing, you know, and, you know, with my mother in the Union of Jewish Women, she was such a central person to growing up in Kimberley. So it's lovely to have you both here and uh, pay tribute to your mom and to, to your dad, especially tonight as it's his uh, uh, um, your thoughts. So Tony, now we can s even see your picture. So I take it you can unmute yourself also if you manage to get your picture on. Tony Isaacs. Can you hear me speaking now? Yeah, now you can hear you. No, now you've muted yourself again. Now, now you can hear me. Yeah. Yes. Wow, that's super. Okay. Well, here I am in in London, um, still working. Amazingly, no. It's, it's, um, I've been paused a bit by the COVID, but in actual fact, I'm I'm still a busy doctor here in London, and uh, but I haven't worked for a whole year now. So I don't know what's going to happen because when I think going back at say 87 years old, I'm not quite sure that I feel like doing it, you know. Okay. Um, my association with Kimberley is, is, um, is almost threefold. Uh, I wasn't born in Kimberley, Shirley was. My sister Shirley Allen was. She says she wasn't. Okay, anyway, she'll be able to. Uh, well, I think she, I'm not sure if she's born in Kimberley or she was born in Musenberg as well, but we were, we went to Rhodesia when I was very tiny. I think I was a year old. And we lived in Rhodesia in Salisbury. Um, and unfortunately, I suffered from bad asthma. And someone made the suggestion. There was no treatment, of course, of course for asthma, nothing at all. And uh, uh, I nearly died a few times. And then they decided to send me to my auntie, Frida, who who lived in, in Park Road in, in, in Kimberley. And uh, unfortunately, there was no one to take me, to come with me. So my mom put me on the train and, and I was three years old. I went all by myself from Rhodesia to Kimberley at just about two days and a night. And I remember coming into Kimberley station and looking out the window and seeing all the people. And I thought to myself, I, I didn't know what my aunt looked like, and she had a picture of me. And uh, all these people were, were, were on the platform, and I thought, well, if she's not there, the train will go on. Probably, I don't know, I knew it was Cape Town was, was the end destination. And anyway, she waved to me and uh, took me off the train, and I stayed with her in Kimberley for a year and a half. I don't even remember speaking to my mother for a year and a half because it didn't happen that you made phone calls those days and um, 
my mum, I used to write, I learned to write a letter. By the time I was about three and a half or four, I could write a letter and my aunt posted it. And and uh, eventually, oh, when I was about four and a half, my mom came to fetch me. And at that stage, I went to a, a nursery school around the corner from my house. It was not around the corner, it was in Park Road. And all the boys around here remember going to that thing. David went to that, to that nursery school. Many of the people around here probably went to that same nursery school. Um, I then went back to Rhodesia and at, at uh, my parents then decided to come to live in uh, Cape Town. And I came through Kimberley again. And this time I went to, um, to I think it was, um, they mentioned the name of the school, the junior school, Bel Belgravia. And I was in school in Belgravia for maybe a, uh, six months or something. And then we went on to Cape Town. And after I had, uh, we lived in Cape Town, I had my Bermuda in Cape Town. Then some problem happened with um, that aunt who looked after me and my, my grandfather who had um, uh, Jaime Cohen, who had uh, the cycle works, I think it was called the Union Cycle Works on the Market Square, uh, was all by himself because his, his, his wife had died. And I, my mom and, and father came back to Kimberley and we were in business then with my grandfather. And uh, that was this, the, the, the next time that I stayed in Kimberley for three years. Uh, and, I, and I rejoined my friends from 100 years back at, in Kimberley Boys High School. And eventually I, I matriculated and I went to Johannesburg and, and I became a doctor. And that was the whole the whole story. And now Shirley is still in Kimberley. My brother Les is 90 now. He's in Cape Town and still runs a business. Um, and, and I'm here in London. Unfortunately, my wife died uh, three years ago. So, and it's with the uh, COVID, it's been a bit difficult, but I'm managing it. And it's so nice to see all you people. I remember talking about, you talked about Beryl Ben. And, and, and Phyllis, uh, uh, my, my brother went out with, uh, I can't think of her name now. Uh, my sister Shirley will remember who, uh, who, who she, he went out with as a, as a girlfriend. And uh, I remember things of Kimberley that really um, remind me of Kimberley is her beer, her beer and ginger beer. Because you, you couldn't get ginger beer in the world like Kimberley ginger beer. And her beer, of course, was just something special that you got nowhere else. There's nowhere else. And every now and again, you meet up with people all over the world uh, who come from Kimberley, and it's amazing. It's an amazing, amazing place. We used to go out, David Levinson and, and, and Shirley at, and, and, and David Allen and Ellie Schles. We all used to go out on a Saturday night and go visiting and walk home in the streets absolutely no problems at all and no danger. And it's something that I'll always remember, that kind of a calmness that Kimberly had, it was amazing, really amazing. I remember you, Geraldine, you were the, the younger sister of, of uh, uh, Theo, mm -hmm. and, and of course your father, uh, and, 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 and your father's brother sort of stimulated me to want to become a doctor. Oh, really? Good. So nice of you to see all your people. Yeah. Thanks for coming on. And uh, very nice. Uh, I'm okay. going to go to um, Theo Klavansky for a brief moment. And then I want uh, Leon Chonin. And then we're going to go to Shirley and David and to, to Barney. So uh, if if you need to be speak, uh, in, you know, if I've missed you out, let me know. Send a note in the chat. Um, so, um, Theo is here. Theo uh, can you hear me all right? Yes. Now, Good. everybody thinks you Theo Kretzmar is my brother, but uh -huh. he, he, <laughs> he's not on. He had a little beard like that a few weeks ago, but he's taken it off now. <laughs> but anyway, uh, you carry on. Firstly, I must tell you that my mother spoke of the Kretzmars often. When I saw your name, Auerbach, I had no idea. And then Trevor told me that uh, that you were friends 
that you were contemporary when you were children. So Auerbach I didn't know, but Kretzmar I certainly knew. My mother spoke often. So I was born in Kimberley uh, just before the Second World War. And um, I came uh, a few yes. times. Who are your parents? Uh, my mother was Lily Blumenthal. My father was Jack Klavansky, later Rabbi Klavansky. And he used to tour the country uh, to all the little Chadurim, the little Hebrew schools around the country. And um, he spent many months in the year away from home, just touring and going to teach all the teachers, really, at all the little Chadurim. So um, I have a picture of, um, I don't know if you can see this, but this is Grandpa, that's Max Blumenthal, and yours truly at the age of a few months, no more than that, because the first four months of my life I spent in Kimberley. I came back in 1944, uh, just round about the time that Grandma, uh, Grandpa passed away. And I was back in, I think, 1946 or 47, when Grandma became ill and she passed away. And I spent uh, the, last, the last term of Standard One at uh, Kimberley Boys High. And uh, all the teachers there told me that they had beaten my Uncle Jack, Jack Blumenthal. <laughs> so um, I have many pictures. Um, so cousins, uh, Daphne Gillis and Trevor are siblings and um, they are first cousins of mine. Barbara Rubenenko, Barbara Horn was mentioned earlier. And here is a picture, I don't know if you can see it, but this was taken 40 years ago in London. There is Trevor and Charlotte and David and Felicity and my wife at the time, Marion and my son, Richard, who turns 51 today on the 21st of February. So that's 40 years ago. Happy and um, let's see, here's a, here's a picture of my mother, date unknown. And here is a picture of my great grandfather, Avram Sachs, who, uh, who was in Bloemfontein. And in fact, uh, grandma Gertrude was his daughter. And um, Max Blumenthal traveled uh, from wherever he was, uh, wherever he was based at the time. I think it might have been Beaconsfield. But in the siege of Kimberley between October 1899 and uh, February 1900, uh, they wouldn't allow any of the men out, but they allowed him in so that they could get married around in, in 1900, in the early months of 1900. And um, so my mother was the second of seven children. The oldest was Rose, who passed away from a burst appendix, unfortunately. She was uh, a, an artist in, in oils and in charcoal. And my mother was left as the oldest of the remaining children. And um, then the first of our cousins of my generation was Daphne Gillis, who, and Daphne, it was wonderful to see you. And uh, then I was the oldest of the next, uh, of the main body of the cousins. And due to Barbara's parents in Stainsrust, uh, they had the idea of inviting as many of the cousins as possible uh, in the winter holidays. And we were there three or four years in succession and became and got to know each other as siblings. And we've been extremely close ever since. So, um, uh, I, what I, I did, I, I qualified as an electrical engineer at WITS in Johannesburg. And um, in due course, uh, I was always keen on the idea of America and found myself eventually in 1985 leaving South Africa to, um, to go to uh, a small community on the West Coast. Uh, Daniel Lappin was the eldest son of Rabbi Avram Chaim Lappin, who was in Yeovil in Johannesburg. I was there for nine years. I then went to Denver for seven. And then I met my, um, my angel 20 years ago. 
and we've been in Florida ever since. And for 18 years, we've been in Boca Raton, Florida, which is kind of um, uh, 25 miles north of Fort Lauderdale, perhaps 50 miles north of Miami. And there are quite a lot of South Africans there too, aren't they? So thank yeah. you. Thank you, Theo. That's lovely. I think it's now Leon. You've been... And, um, before, before, I, before I leave, I must give you a, a lot of praise for putting this together and for staying with us with all the, the Kimberley newsletters. It has been a real connection with history. So thank you very much. Absolutely. I'm going to drop out at this stage and uh, thank you very much for doing this. Thanks for coming in. Thank Leo. you. Yep. Okay. Um, okay. Well, last week I uh, I gave a little synopsis of, uh, of my history, but I'll repeat it again for the newcomers. Um, I want to welcome my Canadian colleagues, um, the Benjamins, uh, the Otis family, um, the Otis family I see regularly because Lenny used to, uh, until he retired, was my uh, close dentist and looked after my teeth exceptionally well. Um, I, I'll give you just a little background about me. Um, uh, my family um, immigrated, uh, my father from Lithuania, uh, my grandfather from Poland, and they, uh, they came to came to Kimberley in about uh, 1928, 19, and my father about 1929. Uh, I, I was born in Kimberley. I went to school at Kimberley Boys High. I matriculated there. Um, I, I, I had the distinguished pleasure of being, of being taught by Daphne, um, who taught me in standard six. Um, but I could never achieve the... Uh, the, 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 the accomplishments of Trevor Tobe, who, uh, who was really an outstanding Kimberly Boys R scholar. Uh, after matriculating, um, I went to Johannesburg, I went to Wits University. Um, I did my CA, uh, I followed it up with uh, some other courses. Uh, uh, I did a high diploma in computer processing and, da and data processing. Uh, I also did my masters. Um, I also did my Israeli CPA. Uh, I'd had hoped of immigrating uh, to Israel, but uh, my wife was not really interested. So uh, we said we landed up here in Toronto. Um, after qualifying, I, um, I, I went into commerce and, and uh, I eventually became a chief executive officer of an engineering company, uh, international engineering company uh, in South Africa. And um, when they were eventually uh, merged and uh, acquired by a Finnish corporation, um, I left them. And at that point, both my daughters had emigrated. My elder daughter had emigrated to Cleveland, Ohio, and my younger daughter to Toronto. So um, we came here to Toronto in about uh, nine, in about 2001. So we've been here about 20 years. Um, but the last time that I recall going to Kimberley was when I was involved with this engineering company. Um, our client was uh, Session Iron Ore Mine, and uh, I regularly would go and visit him. I'd fly to Kimberley and uh, hire a car and go up to Session. So I, yeah, I saw you know, a lot of Kimberley at that time, um, but only in and out. I really didn't stay over very long. Uh, I think that's sort of a, a, a synopsis of, uh, of my history. Uh, my family were were very involved with the shul. Uh, my grandfather was a chazan Chaini, as we called him. Uh, my father uh, also regularly davened in shul, uh, and they were very involved in the community. My grandfather was a worthy brother of the HOD, uh, and I, my involvement with uh, in my youth in Kimberley was uh, I was Rosh Madrich of the uh, Habonim. Um, so, uh, and I think that probably gives you a little basic of what I've. Uh, and since uh, leaving Kimberley. I'm sure Geraldine's going to talk about uh, the future of the Kimberley Shul. And um, at that stage, I'd like to give you a little a presentation that I've done um, about my views on, on the preservation of the Shul. So I'll hand that back over to, to Geraldine. Thank you, uh, Leon. Um, 
I think now it's time that we we invite Barney to talk to us again. Um, do tell us how things are in Kimberley and how you are. And um, it's lovely that you be here to talk to us. You need to unmute. <clears throat> Thank you, Geraldine. First of all, it's great to see my cousin Mark and also earlier to see Jonathan. Um, just uh, listening to the, to the discussion this evening, uh, just a couple of things I'd just like to add to some of the stories. Uh, Itamar Shine was speaking about a gentleman by the name of Ming Chan Yan who was a wonderful man, wonderful businessman in Kimberley. And sadly, about six months ago, uh, he passed away from COVID. Um, Jonathan, my cousin, has uh, a wonderful distinction at my bar mitzvah. His father was asked to schnodder and he donated his wife and family. <laughs> jo <laughs> Jonathan, uh, belongs to the shore. Uh, Linda, saw Linda tonight, Linda Capon, and she was saying that next year she will have been out of school for 50 years. And uh, interesting bit of trivia, 49 years ago, I accompanied her to uh, the trick dance. <laughs> <laughs> and um, the many people speaking here about uh, having gone to Kimberley Boys High. Well, uh, my cousin Mark and I, we went to the other school. We went to CBC. And uh, I'm still involved with CBC. I'm still the chairman of the Board of Governors there. And uh, today it is a school of over, over 1,100 uh, pupils, which is quite remarkable. And... Um, you all want to hear about the show? Well, we're still very much a going concern. Um, we have services every Friday night. Uh, we keep all the chagim. And as I said before, once a year, we become a, a full community because um, we have a team who've been coming since the year 2000. This year will be the 21st time that they've come. And uh, we get an influx of around 30 people. And uh, Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur is very special uh, in Kimberley. Uh, last year, we had hopes of making it a great event because it would have been the 118th uh, anniversary of the shul, uh, or the opening of the shul, which opened in, uh, on Rosh Hashanah, 14th of September, 1902. But unfortunately, it didn't happen. It was uh, COVID that put a spanner in the works. And we are looking at uh, next year, uh, 2022, which will be the centenary of the opening of the shul. Um, it's not easy. Uh, funding is always a problem, but we do have a tenant, the old uh, um, hall, the communal hall we have let out uh, to a church and that provides the basic money to keep our community going. Um, I heard there was a lot of discussion about the future of the shul, etc. Um, what I'm going to say is we have to keep the shul complex going and going as an uh, income earning enterprise because we have two very large cemeteries to take care of. And cemeteries in South Africa are a major, major problem. There is no government funding. Uh, most of the cemeteries in an absolutely atrocious state, except for the Jewish cemeteries. Uh, I'm involved 
in uh, another role as chairman of the Small Jewish Communities Association. Uh, we take care of 220 cemeteries in defunct communities around the country. And uh, it, is, it is a major issue. And uh, our own two cemeteries here, because we are a functioning community, we have to look after them. And uh, even if there's no community here, somebody is going to have to look after them. And we have to provide the income for that to, to happen. Uh, people have asked, are often asked me the question in a very derogatory sense saying, why are you worried about the dead? And if you are Jewish, you should have an empathy for those who have passed, who cannot help themselves, and you need to help them. One of the things, and just listening to the stories this evening and watching everybody, I see Bobby Ben has finally arrived. Hi, Bobby. Um, one of the, the things that I've said to people traveling around the country, raising funds for uh, cemeteries, um, we are a special community. When I say, I'm not speaking now, Kimberly, I'm talking about the South African Jewish community and all of you came from the South African Jewish community. Um, approximately 90% of the Jews that came to South Africa came from Lithuania. Now in 1870, there were approximately 240,000 Jews in Lithuania and 40,000 of them, um, that's just about 20% came to South Africa. We all know what happened in Lithuania during the Shoah. There was nothing left. And so the graves that lie all over South Africa are in effect the memory or the graves of the Lithuanian Jewish community. And for that reason alone, uh, people should be moved to assist and to help in preserving uh, those, 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 uh, those graves. In our own case, if you go to the Pioneer Cemetery where we've had enormous problems, it's a very bad area today. Um, we've got graves going back to the 1870s and it's uh, poignant. You go there and the men, most of them died before they were 40. And uh, it's, it's, it's quite incredible walking through there, looking at the gravestones, seeing where everybody came from, very few born in the same place, et cetera. So when you think of Kimberley and you think of the Kimberley community and you think of the shul, most of you've got parents or grandparents buried in those cemeteries, the two cemeteries. And it is my aim to see to it that whether we become defunct or we survive, uh, that there will be uh, a system in place to look after those two cemeteries. Uh, we will do it through the Small Jewish Communities of, uh, Association of South Africa, because that is one of, one of its core functions. But uh, the way that we do it through the SJCA is that uh, communities that have become defunct in the main have left funds uh, to care for those cemeteries. So there are many cemeteries where there are no funds. Uh, at the moment, we, we're looking at Harry Smith. And it's quite amazing. I was sent the list of the names. And in amongst the names, I saw Kentridge. And I phoned Rob uh, and I said, Reb, this is the name we've got to follow. The Kentridge's became very, very famous in South Africa and in England. And we did, and they're going to assist. Uh, but the interesting thing is that Kentridge did not start out as Kentridge. It was originally Kantovich. It was a, a Rabbi Kantovich in Harrisville. And he changed his name to Kentridge so that his uh, children would uh, move forward in the anglicized environment in which uh, they were living. So that really is um, where we are. If 
we want to know what do we plan for the synagogue. My planning is that the synagogue should last as a community, a live community, as long as possible. I foresee that we could very well be around for another 10 to 15 years. And uh, it is also my aim that uh, the complex that we have in Memorial Road uh, should remain non-commercial and uh, that it should remain income producing so that when we are gone, that the cemeteries should be looked after. As I said, we do have one tenant, a very good tenant. And uh, we also have uh, very good donors who assist us on an annual basis. And it is our intention to continue along that path. Thank you. Thank you very much, Barney. It's good to hear that from you. Um, Shirley, can you now let us know where you were born, please? And you and David can uh, <laughs> have, a, have a go. Can you unmute yourselves? Right, we should. Okay, am I there? Yeah. yeah. No, Tony and I were both born in Musenberg, but my eldest brother, Leslie, was born in Kimberley at Sister Tyler's nursing home. <coughs> Leslie lives in Cape Town and he will be 91 in April. And, uh, <coughs> sorry, I've got a frog. And uh, but we always came to Kimberley for holidays, and uh, as Tony was saying, that we passed through Kimberley from Rhodesia and went to Kimberley Junior, and then I uh, went on to Cape Town where I went to uh, Good Hope Seminary, but came back here in about standard six and finished matric at Girls High. And uh, our families have always been here, my grandfather. And all the my aunts, my mother and aunts and uncles started off in Bar Barclay West in the 1990s and 1890s. the 1890s and came into Kimberley about 19, what, uh, 15, 1916. And my two uncles went to Boys High, two of them I know went to Boys High School, where they were both Victor Lodorums. I found their pictures on the walls once when I went there. And, what were the uh, names? Sorry? What were the names? Teddy and Max Cohen. Yeah. Was that on your board, Leon? Your, <laughs> your, your sister-in-law's father. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And um, so Geraldine and I are also connected because my cousin is married to her brother. So there's always these connections that uh, come through. And Uncle Max uh, was, Ted, Teddy was 103 when he died and Uncle Max was nearly 100. Yeah. So uh, hopefully we've got a long lived family. <laughs> and uh, David and I came back to Kimberley when we'd been in England for three years after we got married. We came back for six months because Aubrey Sachs had a job on the go and he wanted David to come here to help finish it off. And uh, 58 years later, we're still here. It was the longest six months in history. <laughs> and, uh, okay. and it's been a very good six months. It was a good place to live. It was a good place to bring up children and grandchildren on and off. And uh, we had a visit from a great grandchild uh, a month or two ago. My eldest grandson is, what, 37. 38. Oh my so goodness. it's, uh, and he came here very often as a little boy. He used to come here for all his school holidays and still very much identifies with Kimberley. Oh. And, uh, and uh, that's, uh, we've, had a, we've had a very good life. And thank goodness for Barney, <laughs> who keeps us all going. Yeah, and absolutely. Barney's wife, Maud, is wonderful. She sees to everything there, and Trevor and Hubri and the few people that are here. I still speak to Phyllis Sachs regularly. Phyllis is about, we've both been isolating. Phyllis has been isolating in her flat and me here, but we speak to each other every week. Phyllis is going to be about 92 this year, I think, and full of beans still. 
and uh, unfortunately the community as we knew it which was fantastic is so re reduced you want to say no all i wanted to say the the uh, few connections everybody was interconnecting your grandfather my father uh, mr bergman my father was his apprentice he became a diamond buyer under under mr bergman he was an apprentice to bergman and he was also his driver for a few years because uh, that stage he, he got his license uh, and then um, Daphne Gillis's father uh, was a boarder with my grandmother in uh, Mrs. Allen uh, in, at Kim, what they now call Kimberley North so there was there's a direct connection with them uh, you know so as you said three people generally are interconnected one way or another in Kimberley it's quite interesting the uh, of course, in the Browns, the Browns and the Averbucks, you know, that, that was the, the start of the, the wholesale business. That's a very interesting story as well. Uh, but other than that, is, hey, we're, uh, the big thing is that it's still, we still exist. I'm sorry to interrupt, but you remember, I don't know if you remember that your father and my father were partners in, in, in the cinema which was in yes. Beaconsfield, which was indoor and outdoor. That's right. You remember that? Yes, yeah. the Grand. The Grand, right. I remember. I mean, David no. Levinson, actually, I want you to say a bit more because I have to admit that I hadn't switched on the recording when you said what you said originally. So just tell us again <laughs> where you are, David Levinson. To me? Yes. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I can't put them through this again. They don't have to hear it again. Um, well, I, I, I did. I, I, I said. Uh, Just sit back because we can't only see your top I, of your head. <laughs> I said, I said um, what I had actually done when I went back to Kimberley, but um, subsequently to that, uh, I, having graduated as a pharmacist, I went to Johannesburg for a year and then went to Durban. Uh, got married and then spent a number of years in Durban. Uh, Milton and Norma also came to Durban. Uh, and then in 1978, we emigrated to Los Angeles, uh, where I went into the hospital business again and uh, have lived here ever since, very happily. We love LA, uh, but uh, I often think and talk about... Uh, about Kimberley and uh, the things that we did there. I stay in touch with Eddie Schlers. We call it each other on our birthdays every single year. Um, and um, another little story, uh, I don't know if it's appropriate, but uh, uh, we went uh, one, one evening, there was Alan Dave and uh, Ellie and myself and we went after uh, going to the plaza, we went to Johnny Myberg's fish and chips to go and get some fish and chips. And in Johnny Myberg's, there was a group of uh, Afrikaners that were not very friendly to Jews. And they kept on talking about the Yoda, the effing Yoda and the effing Yoda. And eventually we ran out of there. We took our fish and chips and we got in the car. And Alan Dave said, mm -hmm. if they would have called me that one more time, he says, I would have taken him down. He says, but he <laughs> waited, got into the safety of the car before he said anything. We never said a word. But that was the unfortunate side of Kimberley. There were many times uh, that uh, we, did, we did face a lot of anti-Semitism, unfortunately. But we, we learned to deal, deal with it. Uh, we learned how to get on with people, and that was part of the uh, experience. And um, it was it was a great, great town to live in. And I've often told my kids and Jennifer that I have never regretted the fact that I spent my first 20 years in Kimberley. It, it was very, very fond memories and uh, served me well, I think, in my life. Yeah. Thanks, thanks, David, for putting you through that <laughs> again. Uh, let's welcome Bobby now, Bobby Ben. Hey, Bobby. Am I unmuted? Can you hear me? Yes. 
All right. Just before we, uh, before I speak, I want to remind David Levinson yes. that at one point I came to Durban and for a year we were associated in business in Durban. I remember. You remember that? <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. So um, I, I'm originally from Port Elizabeth. I came to Kimberley in 1947 when I was 10 years old. I went to uh, CBC all the, my school years and one of and one of my best friends in CBC was Bernard Benjamin, whom I'm very happy to see here on the Zoom this morning, Bernard. <laughs> and uh, I remember all the Kimberley people very well, Norma and, and, and Milton and David, and Shirley and David, Ellen and all the, Barney, of course, all the Kimberley people that I see, Ms. Uh, Leon Chonin, all of you, Joy Capon, I remember all, everybody in David Diamond, all, all the Kimberley people that I see, I'm so happy to see you all. Um, Julie and I uh, met in uh, Kimberley, got married in Kimberley, lived all our lives in Kimberley. And in 1990, we emigrated to the United States, uh, stayed in Irvine, Southern California, uh, together in the same town as Delia's sisters, Cheryl, Brown, uh, who is now, of course, Cheryl Berman, whom I see also there on the screen, hello, Cheryl, and, De and Jennifer Brown, who is now Jennifer Golden. And we all stayed there with our children in Irvine. And uh, in 2007, I retired. I, I, I became a pharmacist in, in the United States. I worked in, in a hospital pharmacy and then in retail pharmacy became a pharmacy manager in a drugstore chain. And uh, 2007, I retired. A year later, Delia retired from her job in 2008. And then we moved to Baltimore to be with our eldest daughter, Laura, and her family to help them with their family and their businesses. And we've been in Baltimore ever since. And that's where you were this morning. <laughs> <laughs> You see that that's lovely. It's so so good to bring everybody together and to do that. Leon, did you want to come back? You have to unmute. You have to unmute. Okay. I'd like to come. Oh. Well, it's a very important topic for all of us to focus on. Uh, in saying that, I want to thank Barney for the tremendous work that he does for the community. And um, he's really, with, without him, I'm not quite sure, you know, how the, the community would survive. But let, let me put a few thoughts to everybody. And that is, you know, what is the most important question to address? Um, is, should the Kimberley Shore be preserved for future generations? Or should it be allowed to disappear into history? The Shul has served four generations of Jews who originated predominantly from places like England, Germany, Lithuania, and Poland. These immigrants brought their traditions to South Africa, one of which was their strong belief in Judaism. They built two shuls to represent their desire to preserve their religious traditions. Brenner Shul very closely resembled the shuls in the shtetls of Lithuania and Poland. The shul was built by the less sophisticated Jews as they felt uncomfortable in the more modern Memorial Road shul built by the more affluent members from England and Germany. The Brunner shul is no more. It has been demolished and hence its impact on the religious lives of the Jewish community has been lost for all time. We are left only with a Memorial Road shul which is over 100 years old. If we as representatives of former and current residents of Kimberley, Jewish community, fail to preserve the Memorial Road Shul, it will be no longer be a, a symbol of a once vibrant community. It will be no evidence, no footprint, that Jews ever lived in this once diamond city of Kimberley. Future generations will have to resort to looking at pictures of two shuls to be able to gain an understanding of our religious convictions and culture. I believe this to be a tragedy. If one considers how Israel is investing millions to excavate the old symbols of Judaism in our, in our ancestral homeland. I must admit that my passion 
and motivation for preserving the shul is fired by my late grandfather and my father's memories as both were deeply religious and observant Jews who regarded both shuls as their spiritual home. I also recognize that preservation of one of the most beautiful shuls in the world takes more than passion, but requires financial muscle. The shul cannot be left vacant and unattended as vagrants would invade premises and slowly brick by brick dismantle a building that would in time precipitate its demolition. The proposed use needs to satisfy a need that would be able to generate an income stream to service its operating costs. The peers, I understand, has abandoned Kimberley and is offering their existing buildings to the local government. Hence, while they assisted the Jewish community in establishing the shore, they are unlikely to come to its rescue as a symbol of Jewish, of Kimberley Jewish presence. I personally have extended ne network feelers to non-Jewish people in Kimberley who I have known since my youth. The suggestions have been as follows, an interfaith center, a human rights museum, a place of peace like the Baha'i temple in Haifa. They did have their reservations, however, and that was that there was, wasn't sufficient support for such facilities in Kimberley and whether the Kimberley attracts enough tourism to warrant operating such centers. I understand from David Alan, that it was proposed that the shul should be offered to the government as a possible legislative assembly. So what is needed to achieve some sort of success in preserving our shul? The project needs sponsorship from philanthropists like Brian Joffe, Stephen Kossoff, and Adrian Gore, and the last, who are the last of the more affluent Jewish donors in South Africa. The project needs a local leader who will take ownership of the idea and who may ultimately become its custodian. We need to canvas support amongst expat residents and existing permanent residents of Kimberley to gauge the positive interest in preserving the shore. Otherwise, if there's no emotional attachment to this Jewish symbol, it may ultimately face the same tragic fate as the Brenner shore. Eli has also offered some possible sources of finance and support such as the Cape Town Jewish Museum. While expat communities in UK, Australia, Canada, and the USA may offer some financial, some limited financial support, they will not be prepared to shoulder too much of the burden or accept a long-term commitment. The onus, for obvious reasons, must fall on the local Jewish communities. Tel Aviv Muse Museum of Art, the uh, Beit Hatzot, the Museum of the Diaspora may be another institution that may offer some assistance. So these are some of my ideas and some of proposals that we can all consider. But I think it's a, we all have an obligation as ex-Kimberley people, as residents of Kimberley, that we have to preserve the Kimberley shore. We need to leave some form of heritage there that represents our forefathers, our families, our friends that, that lived in Kimberley. I'll leave it over to you now. Thank you, Leon. Uh, Geraldine, could I, I come want, in here? Well, I just wanted to say that this is Leon's own views. It's not the views of the expats. And But we wanted you to know that there are expats who would reach their hands out to you if you wanted because obviously you know you are the one in charge and you know and you are doing so much but we're ready if you wish to to um help start the deliberations i mean and leon's kind of i feel jumping very much into the future which is perhaps um not where we should go, but please come in, Barney. Okay, look, um, in the first instance, it is absolutely, we're on the same page, it is my intention to preserve the synagogue. I have worked tirelessly at it for 20 years since I became the, uh, the governor. 
Um, Leon has given a good summary of the background to the shul, but something which is not really known in the uh, diaspora, but the shul hasn't got a 100-year history, it's got a 178-year history. Until very recently, approximately three, four years ago, I discovered everybody always said the Kimberley Shul was modeled on some shul in Venice. Well, that's incorrect. The Kimberley Shul was modeled on the Semper Shul in Dresden in Germany. And what is absolutely uh, amazing, the Semper Shul was built in 1840. It was opened in 1840 in uh, Dresden. Um, our shul looks like a miniature. It was a lot bigger, but exactly the same structure from the front, the dome, all these things, very, very, very similar. Uh, the Semper shul was destroyed and burned to the ground during Kristallnacht in 1938. But the replica survives and has always been, and you might all think I'm crazy, but it's always been in the back of my mind that one of the reasons it has survived against all odds is that it is a continuation of this tradition. When I was uh, cleaning up for my daughter's wedding and I was looking in the library, I found a humash that was published in Dutch and in Hebrew in Amsterdam in 1840. And here it is in the Kimberley Shul 178 years later. So yes, it is my intention, always has been my intention uh, to ensure that this shul survives. I have been working very actively through the Small Jewish Communities Association to uh, preserve it um, as a museum to all the country synagogues in South Africa, that we have artifacts from all of the defunct country communities. Um, and that is the plan. If there are expats who have access to funding, I would be very happy to speak to them. Um, my uh, priority goes to preserving the shul itself, because I think that the additional lineage, the additional um, 60 years that I'm speaking about is incredibly important. Our enemies, tried to destroy us, but yet this little shul remains. And the year that, when we found, when I found that Chumash on uh, Yom Kippur, we actually read the Pasha out of that Chumash. A uh, very powerful moment. So um, it is definitely my intention. I know David is with me. I know Barry is with me. We would like this shul to survive. If we can't survive as a functional community, uh, something uh, one must understand that the Jewish community of South Africa as a whole is in terrible distress. When I say distress, I mean that it has been absolutely emaciated by migration. And in the last couple of years, particularly, um, our overarching community organizations are falling apart because they were designed for much, a much larger community. The South African Jewish Board of Deputies, one of the reasons that the country community section was closed, uh, is in great distress. Uh, it was an uh, organization designed for a community of over 100,000, and we are now maybe, maybe 50,000 Jews in the whole of South Africa. So it's... Uh, it's not isolated and our future as the Kimberley Shul, the existence of the Shul itself, 
uh, the maintenance of our cemeteries is tied up in the collective solution that we find for the rest of the country because it is too big for individual little communities of 10 or 15 people uh, to tackle. We have to tackle it uh, collectively. We are trying to do that at this stage, but uh, I want to show you that from my point of view, uh, I don't want to see the Kimberley Shul end up as a tire fitment center, which is what happened in Uppington. I don't want to see it end up as a commercial shopping mall. I want to see it preserved as a museum. And uh, another thing that people don't realize, now I spoke about the South African Jewish Board of Deputies. South African Jewish Board of Deputies had an enormous collection of art by Jewish artists, South African Jewish artists. And because of their difficulties, um, they got rid of that collection. So the probably the biggest collection of art uh, produced by South African Jewish artists lies here in Kimberley. It lies at the William Humphreys Art Gallery, which was in the main started by Jews. If you look at the um, the, the original donors, the plaque at the, at the, at the gallery, uh, I think there were approximately nine major donors, and of the nine, six were Jews. Um, I believe that uh, that collection of art could ultimately be displayed in the shul, and that once a year, whether there's a functioning community here or not, that we could still um, put uh, Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur together. This is something David and I have been discussing. Um, but yes, I would welcome your assistance, uh, but it must be very clear to all concerned that my mission is to maintain that building as it is. Uh, I feel very strongly that not only do we owe it to the Kimberley community, but it is also preserving the heritage of the Semper Shul. The Semper Shul was absolutely burnt to the ground. All that remained of it was the Magandovid above the door, was saved by a fireman who uh, represented it to the remnants of the community after the war. So, uh, yes, Leon, I hear you. Uh, you're very welcome to interact with me. Uh, if, and I must be honest, finding the funds in South Africa alone is, um, is probably not possible. I think that this is something that we will ultimately have to go offshore to uh, look for organizations, specifically if we're going to preserve it as a, as a museum, ultimately, uh, two organizations that, uh, that, 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 that specialize in um, preserving uh, Jewish heritage, Jewish artifacts. Something that is not commonly known, but um, Libya had a flourishing Jewish community, approximately 40,000 strong uh, at the beginning of the, the uh, Second World War, um, mainly in the capital in Tripoli, but it was a community that went back 2,000 years. There were amazing artifacts. Um, the only pogrom on African soil in living memory is the pogrom that occurred in Libya in 1946. And from a population of 35,000 in 1946, by 1950, there were only 2,000 Jews left in Libya. And when Gaddafi came to power, he kicked out the remaining Jews, went to Israel, and suddenly, in the last 10 years, a, um, a smuggling of Jewish artifacts has taken place, and they've appeared 
on auctions all over the uh, the Western world. Very sad. We're talking about artifacts that go back 2,000 years. So yes, I don't want to see the Aaron Kodesh in this shul ending up on an auction uh, somewhere in uh, Baltimore or Los Angeles or Toronto. I want to see it in place here. And it's also hugely important. Uh, people do not realize the impact that that building has, the impact that it has in the local political setup. Uh, we are a um, the capital of a province here, the capital of a state. And the local provincial government sees this synagogue and it thinks that we have a population of thousands of Jews in Kimberley. And I am the only white religious leader that gets invited to all the government functions. Um, some years ago, I'll share a story with you. I arrived at the opening of parliament and it was impossible. Uh, I didn't know how I would get into this building. I was a bit late. So I thought, no, put a yarmulke on your head. So I put a kip on my head and immediately the premier's security detachment saw me rabbi and they grabbed me, lifted me on their shoulders and carried me in. So I tell people, that you don't have to go to your yeshiva, you don't have to take smichas, you can become a rabbi in Kimberley very quickly. <laughs> but uh, yeah, now look, we're on the same page. We want to preserve it. It's not for sale. It's not going to become the legislature. That was a thing from the 1990s. Uh, there was a, I opposed that at the time, and I'm very glad that I opposed it. Uh, and uh, Strange but true, we're still here and it's 20 years later. Thanks, Barney. Does anybody want to come ask Barney any questions or um, say anything? Geraldine? Yes? Norma? Yes. Hi. I just wanted to say how interesting this is and what an amazing person he is and how much he does and obviously everything that he belongs to. And uh, if, if it wasn't for him, I don't even think it would exist today. And also, just to finish off by thanking you for doing this. I mean, it's been absolutely amazing. And, you know, just everything you do, but putting this together and seeing all these people is an absolute hoot, I would say, really. I mean, and I'll be in touch with you privately. <laughs> thanks. I mean, you know, it's so easy. <laughs> Yeah, it's so easy. It is. It is. <laughs> You've all discovered this new way. Yeah. So lovely. Somebody else wanted to say something. You want to see this picture? Yes. Oh, that's nice. Painted in 1910. By W. Snell. Oh well, take a picture of it and send it to me. I think we need that. That'll be lovely. Right. Yeah. Anybody else? Joy, your hand is up. Did you want to say something? Yeah. Yeah, please, if you don't mind. I, <clears throat> I actually want to ask a question to Daphne. She's still around. She mentioned earlier that um, she had a house in Kimberley that had become a and b, &B. Now, um, Linda and I are the daughters of Beryl and Dave Capon, and we lived in Mono Street, and our house was a b and um, And I'm just interested to know if it was the same house. Um, is it possible there was more than one in Mona Street that became a b, &B or was it just number 29? So I, I'm actually just keen to hear from Daphne if, I don't, I'm not sure how it could have been the same house because before my parents lived there, my grandparents lived there. Our b, &B uh, was 59. 59, okay, ours was 29, okay. That's you know, of... I'll tell you something, Joy. A lot yeah. of houses in Kimberley are B&Bs. Yeah. Seven yeah. Lodge Road, where my Auntie Hilda lived, is yeah. the Solomons. It's a, a, a little hotel, or it was, I don't know. And that's the house 
I didn't realize at the time when they were living there, it was built for Sir Ernest Oppenheimer and Harry Oppenheimer was born there. Um, when I went back to Kimberley, there was a and b next door in um, uh, Humphrey's house. What was his name? Uh, or it was Wilfred Orr's house, I think. It was, uh, next opposite us in opposite the corner in Dallam Road. And so we booked there. But what did we find? They'd made a and b in their servants' quarters in the backyard. <laughs> 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 Instead of staying at the Solomons, in the, we stayed in the back in the service quarters of uh, 44 Carrington Road. <laughs> yeah. Well, ours was a B and B for quite some time. They called it Milner House, and uh, I believe it recently is no longer a B and B, but it was for for some time. I think they closed it last year or the year before. Close I think. For it, one of close them, we should do a geography of Kimberley in like the 1950s because I can just think off the top of my head eight Jewish families that lived from Connie David at the end through to us, the Malanskis, the Taubes, the etc. etc. Prices, yeah, the prices live next to the Connie and David, and I mean, just then, then the the Carrington Road, you and me, with the, and the diamonds, right? Diamonds. Between uh, you and me, with the Dubovitz, yeah. of course. Well, let, me, let me ask you to put your hands up. How many of you have looked at the website of Kimberley? Yeah, I, you mean yours or yes, ours that we made? No, I haven't. But I looked, I tried to look up in Kimberley and Lucille, I'm going to ask a question Lucille wanted to ask. There were three hotels in Kimberley in our day, but beyond the Crescent, in the center of the city. We can remember the Savoy and the Brand. And we cannot remember the third one. Which the third one was the Collington. The Crescent Hotel. No, not the Crescent. It was on Tapscott Street. The Tapscot Collington Hotel. Was that the one on, on Tapscott right. Street? My, my grandparents lived on Chapscott Street. There was no hotel there. So the Collington was, was the one on town. In, in town. In town. Yeah. Okay, then that's, that's the one I'm town. thinking of. Okay. That was just okay. down from just down on Transvaal Road, wasn't it, David Allen? The Collington Hotel. David, was in David Diamond wants to say the something. The yeah. Collington was in Transvaal Road. Yeah, just Transvaal. off Transvaal Road, Compound oh. Street. Okay. Okay. okay, that's the one. What I want to say to you, those people who've never looked at the website, look at the website. There is the story of Connie David and Louis David, written by Rick David. There's the story of uh, the Malanskis, uh, sent by Delia about her grandparents. There's the story of Shirley's family or the wedding picture of the Morosses. You know, all these stories have been collected and they are there. And you know, when you pass, your story will be there if you've written it. Marion has written a story. Um, you know, it's a wonderful resource and I think you'd be thrilled to look at it. And I don't know why you don't. In every newsletter, I give you plenty of links. You just have to click them and you'll see all the stuff on all the newsletters are on the website, every one. You just have to click it. So I do, I'm sure Eli does as well. Look at it. You know, it's a fantastic thing. I'm, I'm really proud of it. You know, I really wanted to do it. And I wanted Kimberley people to give me news. Of the, and eventually I met Eli, who lives in Perth, Australia. And together we've managed to make this website. So I do recommend it. Um, Barney, we've been really happy to hear what you say and how you said it. As I said, certain people will reach out your hand. You know, maybe if you'll share with us the questions you're asking the people you're talking to. You know, we know people abroad who've got ideas. I know you are very central to this because you're in the very heart of the small communities as their director. So we do admire and respect everything you do. At the same time, we're willing to help as well. I don't think that because we are far away that we've turned our backs on Kimberley. That's not so. Well, thank you very much. <clears throat> I will definitely be in touch with all of you.
And uh, Geraldine, your website is a wonderful resource, absolutely. Um, it, it is a great historical resource. And um, your series on uh, Kimberley Jews in the Second World War was brilliant. Um, just on the online uh, functions, uh, the Hanukkah feature that we did at the end of last year has been watched by 3,000 people. And uh, there were, initially, I know that when it went live, there were a lot of problems, but uh, we're very, very happy that 3,000 people around the world have watched it. And similarly, uh, I'm very happy to see that tonight you have 24 people, and I'm sure last week you had a similar number. Uh, the more that we connect uh, via the technology that is available today, the more that we can achieve. Um, I certainly believe that... Uh, sorry. I certainly, I certainly believe that uh, the expats, uh, not only of Kimberley, but the expats of all the small communities uh, have a great role to play in preserving our Jewish artifacts in South Africa. Thanks, Barney. Eli, you wanted to say something. Yeah, I think in, in summary, uh, w what you've done um, is to highlight the, the fact, the richness of the world of Kimberley, the Jewish world as it's been. But obviously, as Leon has indicated, the more important thing right now is to talk about the future. And as you suggested, I think at our last meeting that we need to get a few people together who see that as the most important thing. So while you and I have been very involved in documenting the history to the future, that is important. Okay, because that's what uh, me as somebody who's not from Kimberley feels very, I mean, you, your camaraderie is it's what you're going to do about it. And I think, as Leon said, I've seen in Europe, I've, I travel a lot to the old Stettlach, and, and many actually have been revived. There are organizations in Europe that are not Jewish that have been doing that. And that's very important to access that as a team rather than work with like uh, no disrespect with the Rabbi Silberhaft. And then you find that the issues in South Africa with him because he was cut loose by the board possibly. Uh, so we have to get people that will take us forward. Okay, and try and cut out the politics. Thank you. Right, so I think that you must be very tired now, ready to have a pee or a cup of tea or whatever time of day it is. It's been wonderful to be able to chat with you. Uh, we can always do it again another time, but I'm going to say thank you. And unless anybody's bursting to say something, I'll close the... Uh, um, David, David Diamond hasn't said anything, and I'm sure he would like just to say hello. I'm sure he has. Huh? David Diamond, have you said something today? Um, not, not, not really. <laughs> um, very nice oh. to see everybody. Thanks, Leon. <laughs> Um, it was just lovely to see everybody and to see my old neighbours, David and Norman and, and um, that Milton and Lucille. It was wonderful. All I have to say is that um, I spoke to somebody here in Cape Town about the show, and they said that every city has a heritage committee, and that is the first place to start. If we go to, our, to the heritage committee and start there and then take it from there, because I think they have the, the, the initial say. I'm not sure. I'm not 100% certain, but that's what I was told. That's all. Thank you. Bonnie, Thank you very much again for everything. Bonnie, can I just ask, can I ask Barney? Barney, Barney, is the synagogue a national monument? No, and happily not. And uh, the reason for that is that uh, there are tremendous restrictions. There's no financial support that comes with it. 
and there's mm. also a lot of politics involved. Um, there was a move to declare it a heritage site in the 1990s, but uh, with the political changes that came, um, the disadvantages of being declared a heritage site, and David Allen will, uh, will, will vouch for me on this one, far outweigh the advantages. Uh -huh. Thank you. Okay. Can I just ask a question? Um, how many Jews are resident in Kimberley? And how many Jews have you indicated, Geraldine, are connected to Kimberley, like your group or people who are fairly active? So how many in Kimberley? And how many would you say with connections outside Kimberley? All right. So the first number I would give you is that they're far, far more outside of Kimberley. We're about maximum 22, 23 people. That's it. Look, I have a mailing list, which may be several hundred, you know, but I don't always hear from all of them. Um, mm. But, you know. But I have actually had a couple of responses from people whose families were actually involved in the building of the shul and who might like to be part of a little team with us to, to help you to, to explore further and to support your ideas because we can see that you are moving in exactly the way we would hope. So thank you very much. And thank you to everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Good night yes. and good morning to those of you in America. <laughs> and well and in Australia. In Australia. <laughs> and in 421. Australia. 421, mate. You can go back to bed now. Lovely <laughs> <laughs> to see everybody. Bye. Good night. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye. Where is it? Okay. Bye. Good. Bye. 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 Bye.